This is the Side Hustle Show with Nick Loper, episode 13. Uh, did you know when I was 13, a little known fact about me, I was the chubby kid during the awkward middle school years. And then over the course of the next year, grew about six inches in a really short period of time. And that uh, kind of stretched everything out. So stretch out, settle down, and uh, get ready for another great episode of the Side Hustle Show. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. Hey everybody, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. This is episode 13 and a little bit of a different take on part-time business today from a more creative and artistic perspective. I'm thrilled to be joined by Melanie Ida Chopko, a member of Side Hustle Nation with an awesome story to share about her journey as an artist and part-time visual facilitator, someone I learned who um, helps companies and organizations translate their ideas into powerful visuals to improve um, employee and client understanding. Now, I had no idea this was a real job or a real business, but Melanie has done work for Google, government organizations here in California, and many other happy clients. This one is definitely worth the listen. If your side hustle is in a more creative space and you'd like to expand by selling to businesses instead of individuals. Also, a big shout out to Jeremy Blanchard from episode eight for the introduction. Melanie, welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Thank you so much. So tell me a little bit about what you do in your work as a visual facilitator. So it's kind of an odd job in that what I do is I go to events and conferences and meetings. And while people talk, I translate their ideas into pictures. So I have this little tagline of you, you talk, I draw, and everyone gets it. So it turns out that our brains are obsessed with pictures it's the way that we most understand the world. So if people are trying to communicate a complex idea or come to some strategy idea, having pictures involved makes it easier for everyone, makes it more memorable for everyone, and makes it a lot less boring. So no Very more. Good. And <laughs> um, yeah, for everybody listening, you, you, you have to check out uh, the website. It's notesinpictures.com. Mm-hmm. And some really beautiful drawings, and, and you can kind of see the the flow of how these ideas are getting um, put onto the paper in um, in picture form. It's really really cool. Yeah, no more death by PowerPoint. <laughs> no, no more. De- so that's kind of the um, the pitch for the the presenter or whoever is holding the meeting. Is we want kind of a different way to present this than going through the traditional slide deck. Exactly. Exactly. Because. You know, you're bringing together a whole bunch of minds into a room, and most of the time, folks are checking their phones, checking their email, or they're engaged in an incredible conversation that they actually will not remember very much of. So as I translate ideas into picture live, people look at these pictures, and they're making memory connections. They're also making connections across a big picture. So the conversations and meetings are a lot more efficient. I love. I'm, I'm very impressed that you're able to listen and draw at, <laughs> in a coherent <laughs> way at the same time. I can barely do anything at the same time. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that people tend to speak really similarly, and that they they speak a lot around the idea they want to share. And then they share the idea and then they speak a little bit more. So one of my teachers used to call it gibble gabble. So people will gibble gabble for a few sentences and then they'll say a very important idea and then they'll go back to blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I record the meat and potatoes. I record the very important idea. And while they're blah, 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 you know, I can illustrate that. So. Very, very good. So did you now do, is your background in in art or in design? Like how I'm curious how you got into this. Um. Yeah, yeah, it's a totally great story. Um, I got into this because I, I moved to California thinking I was going to work with a professor, a scholar that I really respected. OK, it didn't work out. And so I, I was reading the book, What Color Is Your Parachute, which is an incredible book um, if if 
folks have not heard of it, that's been a manual for me, like so many times, you know, from everything from job search to doing interviews to getting really clear on what it was I wanted to do in the world. So I just love that book. And one of the things he recommended was doing what's called informational interviews. And so I was so surprised to do to notice this, but I reached out to people that I respected, people that seemed like really settled and loving of their work and people that seemed interesting to me. And I asked if they would sit with me for 15 minutes over some coffee and I would share a little portfolio of artwork I had done and public art projects and also show some other work I had done, like more in the sustainability sales world. And I was asking if they noticed any intersections, if they noticed any places um, or any fields that were like popping out based on what I had done. So I had been working, when I lived in New York, I worked as a saleswoman for a wind power company. And then I also worked as an educator about waste issues, but I had gone to school for visual art. So I had about two or three years of art school under my belt. And then I switched majors, um, you know, kind of thinking that the visual arts and creativity didn't really have much of a place as I looked around me, seeing that the world was falling apart. And I, I, I kind of laugh at that now because I've really come full circle to see how vital they are. Um, but anyway, so w- The funny part of the story is that I had all these pieces of myself that to me didn't really fit. You know, I loved making things. I I write music. I love music. I also had this experience in sales that I was really good at, but, you know, I didn't really want to work in that field. And then I had so many different interests. And what I did was I wrote all of those things down and I drew them all out on a piece of paper. And so I had this visual map of myself. And I carried that around to each interview. And one interview I sat down and the woman said, you know, Melanie, you're you're asking me, what should I do with my life? What should I do with myself? And I just want to let you know, this is a job. Like you just, you translated all of these complex ideas into a visual and that's a field. And so she put me in touch with a woman that was tapped into the um, visual facilitation community. Okay. I know I had no idea there was such a thing. Oh my God. There, there is such a thing. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. It's probably about 400 people. Okay, cool. 400 people worldwide do this for a living. So that helps when you're pitching companies because maybe they've heard of it before versus it's like, it's a product or a service that they've never heard of. And then you got to start completely from scratch. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the practice was started in the seventies and it's become the, in some places it's the norm. Like for example, Google works with a visual facilitator twice a week, every week for their branding workshop that they run. Okay. So they view it as like an essential part of, of their product. Very cool. Yeah, we. I was just at um, the the World Domination Summit up in uh, Portland this weekend, yeah. and one of the talks was about how creativity is systematically stamped out um, from from ourselves, like in, during the education system. And you know, um, I think this was in um, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, a book um, that you know this guy talks about his career at um, Hallmark. Yeah. Um, he talks about how, you know, if you ask a group of first graders, how many of them are artists and right. every, every kid raises their hand. And if you ask a group of fifth graders, how many are artists and like, it's almost no one. So it's like, you know, this somehow this is creative nature and, and this art gets um, stifled out, out of everybody. Um, so that's awesome that you're able to find a way uh, to make, uh, to make a living doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, these are, these are questions and this is a topic that's very close to my heart um, because I, I really believe that what, you know, what's before us is um, something that nobody knows what to do with, you know, in terms of the economy, in terms of climate change, in terms of nation states and, and um, the only way to, have any hope is to really tap into our creativity because the answers we've been using thus far are not working 
And they're actually perhaps even detrimental. Right. And and, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that I think it's like, not only is it our, our creativity that will save us, but like this creative muscle, I think even it's, it's so sad. It's been kind of atrophied because we don't, we, the creative muscle in it, in painting or drawing or, or, I mean, literally to, to be creative is to create something out of nothing. Like that's, that's almost what's being asked of us in the world today. And so I find it, um, I'm not going to say like making a drawing is political, but I actually find it a very meaningful act. Um, and, and I think there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Right. I agree with you. And, and I think the, the side hustle audience is very much, um, creators and not necessarily art, but like you said, just creating something, whether that's, um, you know, a book, a business, a product, whatever it may be. Exactly. Um, and it's super cool that companies like Google and some of these others, are seeing the value in that. Now you've got a note on your site about kind of the cognitive science of, of visualization yeah. and how, and I've, you know, you, there's stats on, you know, the percentage of people who are visual learners versus auditory learners. Uh-huh. And, and so by, you know, putting those ideas down on paper, you can, I imagine these companies are seeing a return on investment in, in a more engaged uh, listenership. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Eighty percent of people benefit from having visuals. And an even more wild statistic, Nick, is that if you want someone to remember something, if you give them visuals to help remember it, they'll remember upwards of 85 percent. And one of the things. Yeah. One of the things I do with clients when I'm pitching with them is I kind of like put on my saleswoman hat because I used to like sell the hell out of solar panels. (laughs) And, and win credits. And I'm like, guess, I just kind of put on my hat and I'm like, guess how much they remember if you don't have any visuals. And people will say like 50% and I'm like lower. And they're like 40 and I'm like lower. And I walk them down. It's 20%. Wow. Yeah. I'm very much a, a visual learner. So that makes sense to me. So let's talk about like kind of getting your foot in the door at Google. Like how do you go about getting customers as a visual facilitator or, or any, I guess if we can kind of translate onto a larger creative space, like how are you, I love the idea of selling to companies by the way, instead of selling to individuals. Cause I think as an individual art is seen as kind of a luxury purchase. There's only so much wall space anyone has, but company yeah. has a little bit more, um, <laughs> a little bit bigger budget to play with and yeah. uh, and they're looking for an ROI too. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, you know, this has been a big learning curve for me as well. Um, because I've in over the past two years, I've kind of learned where to throw my fishing pole and even, you know, talking with someone like Kai Davis, who was on your podcast a, a couple sessions ago, mm-hmm. you know, learning to ask right out of the gate, like, what's your budget? Because people will come to me really interested in having me do an animation for them or having me do some graphic recording because because the you know it's something whose time has come. People are really realizing that we need to distill ideas and we need to communicate them more effectively. And one of the things that happens though is like folks will come to me with like empty pockets and they'll want to they'll want me to do something pro bono or At the very beginning, you know, I was advised to do as much pro bono work as possible to build a portfolio. So um, how did I get my door, my foot in the door? So (laughs) what's funny is that I had one mentor who advised me to do a bunch of cold calling and like mail out letters and write marketing materials um, and like mail them out cold and then call people up cold and get them on the phone and try to get in and do a practice session. Okay. And I don't, I probably did like 20 or 30 of those, but I was a nervous wreck. I was like such a wreck doing that. You know, like I, I had identified companies I would want to do this for, but they didn't know me from anyone else. And so what, what really was helpful was realizing that, um, you know, I heard from a, a friend of mine that 
like there's so many different strategies to start getting clients and start moving forward. And what's important is finding the one that fits most with your personality. And so that was super hugely freeing. So what I did that was most successful was I wrote, I wrote a letter to my network of friends and colleagues and out, you know, I picked like a hundred people in my network and I wrote a letter to the first 25 and I, I called this letter, like, can you be a watering can? And I drew this watering can like sprinkling down on me and I labeled the watering can you. And (laughs) I wrote a little narrative about how, like, I have this seedling of a, of a business, this, and I would love five contacts from each person of people that they could see as being possible interests. Yeah. Did you you get it from Jeremy? It sounds really familiar to what he was saying. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Jeremy. Yeah. Jeremy totally did that. But what's funny is like I had tried all these other things. Like I was like, oh, I guess I'll sign up on Twitter and like follow people on Twitter and talk about their conferences and talk about their work. And like Twitter is just not part of my personality. But what, you know, but what is my personality is like making a freaking drawing of a watering can and sending it to like 25 friends of mine and calling them up and then asking them because because that was the other thing is it's like start with the low hanging fruit right like Mm -hmm. these are people that already know me and know what I do and have seen it and care about it and of course they're going to recommend me but what was even wilder Nick is that I got actually very few leads I got a lot of leads not a lot of those things turned into sales. Okay. But I got so many cold calls in that period. Like I was looking for the work and the work was finding me. Hmm. Like it was like at least once a week, someone was calling me up about doing a project, doing an animation, doing some illustration. And so I met my financial goal easily during those during those weeks that I was doing all that outreach. Weird, even though not directly attributable to the, um, to to your contacts, huh? Yeah, I think like one of those contacts ended up closing into uh, an actual contract, but, and and I have several of them open, like I use um, Google Streak, which I think is really helpful to label like who's kind of on the burners And then when I complete, you know, when I have a moment where I'm like, oh, nothing's going on, I can go back to Google Streak and look at who's actually still sitting there. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with that tool, so I'll have to check it out. Oh, it's the best. So it's called like a client management software or something. It's it's like a version of Salesforce, but it lives inside of Gmail, inside of your email. Oh, cool. Um, okay, so, yeah, so so we're talking I, about this network. Um, it didn't really pan out, but um, call it karma or whatever. At this around the same time, yeah. clients started coming. In. Were they were they finding you through your website or? They were finding me through my website. They were finding me through references. Okay, I mean, that's an, another thing that was huge. Was every time I would do a job with someone, I would send them a thank you note afterwards. Okay. You know, like follow up with them and really try to maintain some sort of relationship, like in a kind of friendly, playful way. Right. To me. That was something I also learned doing sales work is it's so important to make sure that people know that you see them as a human being, not just a client. Right. So I was getting some references from clients. I was getting cold calls off of the website. I joined... A webs- I joined the um, International Forum for Visual Practitioners, which is a directory of folks that do this work. Okay. Um, yeah, the website for that is really cool. It's ifvp.org. Your very first client, did you end up doing some, some free jobs to build the portfolio or was it paid from the very beginning? No, no, no. I did a fair amount of free work. And, um, you know, that's something I... As someone had advised me, they said, I decided I would work every week whether I was paid or not. Okay. And 
this guy that advised me to do that, I think it was like a really great thing for me to learn the practice and get more comfortable with how to actually do this skill. Cause you're right. There's like a fair amount of kind of hat spinning and you're learning to listen. You're learning to speed draw. Um, and then, yeah. And then you're also like doing sales stuff and set up all that, all that stuff. I, I, I definitely feel like, I've learned I've learned a bit about that though. I did really early I did a job for like very very little money for a one client. Um I think they paid me like $200 to record a meeting that they were doing. Okay. And normally the rate like a half day rate for a 2-hour meeting is like, you know, quadruple that. Okay, wow. And yeah, so the rate for this work is is fairly high and I was happy to do that. Like at the time I needed the money and I, I wanted to support them because I knew this organization. But what came and kind of bite bit me in the butt afterwards was um, they they so valued the map. Like they showed the map to everyone. By the end of the summer, something like 2000 people had seen this map I had made. And and then they sat down with me and they said, okay, we'd like to hire you to do some more recording. And we outlined three different projects that they were really excited about. Uh-huh. And then I wrote them up a proposal. I wrote them a, a memorandum of agreement proposal saying, okay, here's how much it would cost. And I was charging them like the nonprofit market rate for that work. Uh-huh. And they came back to me and they're like, hey, last time we paid you $200 to do this. Like, what's the difference between now and yeah before. yeah and it was wild nick like i was i was kind of offended i was like whoa i like explicitly showed you that i had done a discount but like i was discounting you know i showed you that this this work was worth about seven hundred dollars and i was letting you pay me two hundred dollars but look on the invoice i wrote like five hundred dollar pro bono. Yeah. You know? Good, goodwill discount or, you know, early yeah. bird special, whatever you call it. Um, exactly. And, yeah, and what, what, make sure what, they know it's a one-time deal. <laughs> right. I mean, what was wild to me is that the director said, well, you know, at the end of the day, Melanie, I wrote you a check for $200. That's what it was worth. <laughs> and I was like, wow. whoa. So what I learned from that is even if, and this is what I would say to like all the other side hustle folks is that even if you're doing something pro bono, what I've learned is that I want there to be some sort of exchange. Like I want there to be $500 of exchange. Um, that's not being paid in money, but you know, maybe being paid in some other way. Okay. Cause I, you know, I do believe in like a new economy and like, <laughs> like I'm totally that person that believes that money is messed up and we need to like redefine that. But I think people, it's true. People value what they pay for. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. So yeah, don't, so, don't sell yourself short. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm like, you know, not to be resentful about the situation anymore, but I really, I mean, that was like the best lesson I well, ever learned. Cool. The plus is, you know, if there's anything good about it, they are showing that work off to, to hundreds of other people and maybe it's oh, getting your name out there. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, it was, um, it's priceless what I learned in that situation. So I'm grateful to them in some way. So, and I mean, I was, I was happy to do the work. I was glad I, I'm still glad I did it, but I think I learned like, wow, from now on I decide when something's free. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That so I think sense. that's really important. I feel like, oh. um, the, the starving artist, you know, uh, persona is like a badge of honor for some and like, Oh, if I'm successful, I'm like selling out. Right. But it's like, mm-hmm. Oh no, you can have it both ways. <laughs> Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, especially the value of creating a world that's more beautiful and humorous and um, lovely. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to do the legwork to make your art or your music accessible and um, heard and large enough so that it is a little bit louder than the average hum. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, as we are wrapping up, any other, uh, I guess, takeaways for, for creative side hustlers? I would just, I would just say again, I think this informational interviewing thing is amazing. 
like I was shocked at how how many people got on my team. Like they were happy to sit with me for 15 minutes, for 30 minutes, and they were emailing me the next week asking me how it was going. And so I would advise other side hustlers to really tap your networks, like lean in to people that are already in your network and reach out to people that aren't. You know, I'm about to have an informational interview with an illustrator that I love who lives in San Francisco, okay. Wendy McNaughton. And, um, you know, entrepreneurs or artists like other artists. So we really want to help one another. And it's it's an amazing thing for me to, to like over and over see that is true. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I've not, um, I guess heard that, you know, as a formal strategy, I think that's really cool. Kind of reaching out to kind of people, uh, aspirational folks and say, Hey, you want to meet for coffee? That's awesome. Right. Yeah. And to say, you know, I love what you're doing. How did you do it? How would you suggest that I do it? And what, you know, what do you see? Um, so I, I think that's like a lot more effective than like writing, you know, my writing all these cold, doing all these cold calls and, yeah. and like, <laughs> like to be published or whatever. I mean, people hire people. They don't hire um, pieces of paper and names. Yeah, that's very good. And that's something that everybody um, can start with. That's something that you can take action on uh, right away. Yeah, I love that. I love that question you said, you know, what's the... What is the next right step? And I think asking that question, what is the next right step, is incredible. Yeah, and just making some uh, meaningful connections. That's really cool. All right, very cool. Uh, Melanie, um, if people can find you online, we mentioned notesinpictures.com. Any place else where um, they can come and check out your work? Sure. You can find illustrations that I've made. Um, More fine art illustrations on melaniemadethis.com tumblr.com and i'm in the process of making a music website right now but folks can find me on facebook to hear a little bit of my music and learn more about that okay very cool and we will link to all this stuff uh, in the show notes great all right very good thanks so much for coming on thanks nick you're the best it was so fun all right talk to you soon okay bye All right, guys, ton of great tips in there. I'm particularly excited about Melanie's informational interview strategy and actually plan to start researching and reaching out to some local entrepreneurs to see if I can put that tactic into action myself. Love it. Um, Also want to touch again on the topic of creativity. Now, up until very recently, I didn't consider myself a creative person, right? I'm very much um, an analytical mind, uh, very left-brained, I think, is... I never can remember which side is which. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not writing sonnets or screenplays or creating music or, or painting murals or anything like that. And that's what I thought being creative was. It's not. And like Melanie says, being creative is simply creating something, anything. And at its root, that's our job as side hustlers and entrepreneurs, to bring something new into the world and, um, and make some value from it. So... That's one of my biggest takeaways um, from today's episode is that we're all creative people and indeed we need to be to move our lives forward in a meaningful way. And um, and speaking of moving your life forward, I've got an awesome free gift for you if you head over to SideHustleNation.com and join my email list. Now, I'm not going to spam you or anything, but I will send you my CliffsNote style guide of the world's best business books for side hustlers. So go there, check it out. Let me know what you think. And that's it for this week. I will see you next time in episode 14 where we're going to hear about an outside-of-the-box side hustle investment strategy that has the potential to blow your stock market and your 401k returns out of the water. You're not going to want to miss it. Until then, go out there and make something happen. Thanks for listening to The Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 